Get it. Mike Semper VB here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in iHeart, American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, all of our over-the-air affiliates. Maybe you're listening via podcast or video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully wherever you are, it's sunny outside. If not, hopefully it's sunny inside your mind. Beautiful day here on my portion of Delmarva. As soon as this show is over, I'm going back outside and sitting in the sun. And we need it, too. A lot of violent weather across the Mid-Atlantic over the last couple of days. And I don't know what the weather is like in either Bothell, Washington or Chicago, Illinois right now. But that's where Brian Alvarez and Filthy Tom Lawler are, respectively. Filthy Tom is getting ready to face off against Matt Mikowski for Black Label Pro, the BLP, Midwest Heavyweight title, which is currently held by Mikowski. If you have a Triller Plus subscription, you can watch that tonight. And hey, good news for those of you who only got a Netflix subscription to watch Jake Paul face off against Mike Tyson. That fight has now been rescheduled Friday, November 15th. And it is still scheduled to take place at AT AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. The decision to move the fight came last week when it was announced that Tyson was suffering from ulcer complications after boarding a flight. It was stated that Tyson's doctors instructed him to take it easy during training, and that screwed up the entire timeline for the fight, which was scheduled to take place on July 20th. Tyson is 58 years old. Paul is 27 years old. They announced this fight in March. It will be Tyson's first fight of any kind since a November 2020 exhibition against Roy Jones Jr., where he looked really good, but that was preceded by a 15-year gap in inactivity. The rematch between Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano is going to remain the co-main event and is the actual fight on that show. As always, we've got a lot to get into today. Updates on Chad Gable's contract and Rhea Ripley's shoulder. Give you my predictions for NXT Battleground and New Japan Dominion. No spoiler previews for AEW TV coming up this weekend. Plus a look at last night's TNA Impact. All that and more when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Semper VV here with you. You know, we do Wrestling Observer Live for an hour at a time every single day. But if you want us 24-7, you can try to find me on Twitter slash X. I am at Semper VV. The website is at W-O-N-F-4-W. And the broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. Jim Valley is here with you on Saturdays, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. And on Sunday, Andrew Zarian takes the reins beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 Pacific. I will also love it if you made the wrestling news part of your day. Everything you need to know to get your day started or get you up to date or get you to your favorite wrestling review pod that's long form, like Wrestling Observer Radio, every single day of the year. We can find the wrestling news wherever you find your favorite podcast or head over to the wrestlingnews.com and at wrestling news AV on Facebook and Twitter. And while you're at it, if you love pro wrestling, patreon.com slash mid Atlantic pod, Chad Gable is a potential free agent and he has drawn the attention of both WWE and AEW the headline. You know, it is what it is there, but this was posted up to the website earlier on today by Josh Nason. According to recent reporting by Fightful, Gable's current WWE deal is set to expire soon. In this week's Wrestling Observer newsletter, Dave Meltzer reports that WWE has made an excellent offer to keep Gable. Meltzer adds that if Gable's deal expires, there are key people within AEW that are pushing Gable to Tony Khan. Fightful Sean Ross Sapp stated that he has also heard about internal discussions within AEW about Gable, but did not have an update on his current contractual status. There have been zero indications to this point that Gable is leaving. Gable is currently involved in a heavily pushed storyline with WWE Intercontinental Champion Sami Zayn, and he'll be challenging Zayn for the title at next weekend's Clash at the Castle. The 38-year-old Gable began in the WWE system in 2013 after signing a developmental deal following his outstanding run as an amateur and a very brief stint on the indie circuit. Gable has held the WWE Raw and SmackDown Tag Team titles in addition to the NXT Tag Team title during his career. If I'm WWE, I do not want to let Chad Gable go. And certainly he is not at the level of a 
Roman Reigns, a Cody Rhodes, somebody of that ilk, Randy Orton. But that's a guy that's got an impeccable record inside and outside the ring. You see his ring work. You see how good he is. There is he's, he's never injured. There's never any drama from him. There's never any trouble. You know, his intensity and training, his work ethic, how he carries himself are all positive examples for the company. And, hey, even WWE trusted he and Otis enough to do a Snickers commercial, so there's that too. But once his in-ring career is over, you know, I bet that Gable has the aptitude to do pretty much just about anything he wants in professional wrestling. In front of the camera, he could be a manager. And one that could take bumps, you know, depending on what, you know, how his career ends. You know, a bumping manager is really important if they're a good one. And he's a menace on the microphone. He's proving he can do that. So could he play an authority figure role down the line if you wanted? He could be absolutely could. Behind the scenes, you know, as a trainer, obviously, he fits the bill. His old tag team partner, Jason Jordan, has flourished in the role of an agent. Maybe he could do that and maybe just be a scout. You know, Jerry Briscoe for years and years would travel around and be the guy that would forge relationships with college coaches like the University of Minnesota's Jay Robinson. And that's what ended up opening the doors and making it a lot easier for people like Shelton Benjamin and Brock Lesnar and many others to slide into the system. And granted, with the NIL deals that they have, with how they go about doing things, you know, things are a little bit different. We know that William Regal is active in going to Japan and scouting talent and looking around for talent. And I'm sure that there are other people there that have their eyes open and pay attention to the independent scene. You know, Steve Carino's kid, Colby, has been on the scene forever. I'm sure Steve pays attention to what's going on there. But, you know, that's another role when it comes to amateur wrestlers or being a liaison for amateur wrestlers coming in. I think Chad Gable would be somebody I'd really want to hold on to for that purpose as well, too. It's not just about professional wrestling and the performance in the ring in some cases when it comes to these deals. It's about people's personal enjoyment and what makes them happy, what works for them, and also how a company sees somebody. And I think, you know, Chad Gable is just somebody that is very valuable. He's just coming into his own right now. He's had surety G. He's had a lot of nonsense over the course of his career. Things could not be better for him right now. Much like Drew McIntyre in his situation, much like Damian Priest in him in his situation, all people who's, you know, reportedly have, you know, their contracts have been coming up and you know, at the time they have, things couldn't be going any better for them. So I don't see Chad Gable leaving WWE if he is let go for some reason or he is looking to do something different. It's a no-brainer. Tony Khan should not need cajoling or pushing into signing Chad Gable. Will get Gable make a massive difference when it comes to ratings or pay-per-view buys? Probably not, no. But would I really like to see he and Samoa Joe? Yeah, y yes it would. And would he be valuable for AEW for all of the reasons that I just gave you about WWE? Absolutely. Absolutely, that would be the case. Now, moving on to Rhea Ripley and her recovery. Also in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter today, Dave Meltzer provided an update. He says, quote, Ripley is rehabbing her shoulder rather than having surgery. Right now, she's not scheduled back for SummerSlam, but we were also told if she heals up faster than expected or if the storyline changes to where they need her for an appearance, it's still possible. If rehab can't mend the shoulder enough, she could need surgery, end quote. In April, Ripley was forced to vacate the Women's World Championship. She cut a promo vowing that when she returned, she would be out for blood and would be coming back for her title, which is now held by Liv Morgan, who is now trying to hold Rhea's former man, at least on screen, Dominic Mysterio in Liv's hands, going all after Dom, sliming up to him. So SummerSlam is in Cleveland on Saturday, August 3rd. Her, the timing of her injury was really bad because you had this, you know, divide start happening in Judgment Day. You had Damian Priest, who looks like he's going to flip babyface. You had Drew McIntyre. You know, you had Carlito being brought in. You had all these things that were going to be swirling around that were going to probably build to a big crescendo and then blow itself off. And it's unfortunate that Rhea's hurt. Hopefully, rehab does take care of it because 
the longer you put off surgery, if the rehab doesn't take, then she's going to be out for a whole lot longer. And that's really disappointing because I really think next year, if you wanted to do it and you built it up right, I don't think it would take much to have Bianca Belair and Rhea Ripley close the show at one of the nights of WrestleMania. Now, by that point, Charlotte Flair will be back in on the scene. And again, I, I would much rather have, uh, I would, as a, as a timer goes off here, I would much rather have Bianca Belair against Rhea Ripley. But again, with Charlotte in the mix, possibly by that point to do Rhea and Charlotte again to close out one of the nights of WrestleMania, I'm sure that's something Charlotte Flair would love to do. When it comes to the actual TV for WWE, SmackDown is tonight from the Yum Center in Louisville, Kentucky. They were doing advertising, and I'm not sure if anybody saw this, where you could pay a certain amount of money and sit in a skybox with, I don't, Rose Namajunas, I think. I, for, I forget who it is, and like other UFC luminaries. So that all that sort of crossover stuff and figuring out new ways to get more money out of people by having you know, live on scene events taking place and all the other gimmicks and, and bells and whistles and all that sort of stuff. TKO, you know, trying to pull out all the stops here. They have added Cody Rhodes to the show. He'll be making an appearance after last week he was splattered all over ringside by AJ Styles after Styles faked his retirement. They have advertised three matches for the show, and two of them seem to be building to tag title matches at Clash at the Castle. Indy Hartwell against Jade Cargill and Johnny Gargano against Grayson Waller. The only other match announced for the show tonight is Angel Garza against Apollo Crews. Also being taped for tonight will be next Wednesday's WWE Speed on X show. It's the number one contenders tournament final match between Tommaso Ciampa and Andrade. Got NXT Battleground, New Japan Dominion, plus all of AEW's TV coming up this weekend to get into. And we shall do so when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi here with you. Brian Alvarez not here with you because it's a Friday. And Filthy Tom Lawler not here with you because he's in Chicago for Black Label Pro tonight. Trying to get his Midwest Heavyweight Championship back from Matt Mikowski. I'm surprised Matt Mikowski, who's featured on a lot of GCW and JCW shows, has not broken out a little bit more. He's very good. Although then again, I'm very surprised that Jordan Oliver has not actually broken out somewhere and has not signed on with an NXT or uh, an ROH slash AEW. But uh, notable also in the newsletter, I, I saw this because uh, my friend and co-host of the Adam and Mike Big Audio Nightmare, which is a Japanese wrestling radio show for subscribers over at F4WOnline.com, pointed out that in the newsletter today, Dave Meltzer is saying that it is possible that Marshall and Ross Von Erich may have interest in signing on with AEW slash ROH, they could use it. You know, at this point, and I don't want to say you need to kind of like crap or get off the pot here, but it's been over a decade now since these guys have hit the scene and they have gotten better over the years, but they don't work enough. They don't work on the regular. They don't work with enough teams. They just don't. They just don't. And as of this point, they're really still kind of a novelty you're having the Von Erichs, you know, the, the sons of, of Kevin Von Erich are going to be on the show, the dynasty, the legacy, all that. That's what you have. And, you know, it, Ross is 36. Marshall's still a younger guy. He's 31. And I think you can probably get more out of him as a future singles guy looking forward. But they're going to have to kind of jump in and sign with somebody now. And, you know, they could use it. R ROH. Again, for anything you want to say about ROH or in AEW and the booking and all that, at least they can get reps. You know, they can get dark matches on these shows at the very least, plus getting some more TV time and, and, and getting a little bit better. So we'll see what happens there, but you, you never know. I do want to point out one thing, too, about Clash in the Castle, because, you know, as I mentioned, it feels like we're going to get Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa against Grayson Waller and Austin Theory, which is why they're doing the match tonight, but... The women's side is a little bit more murky in my mind just because I feel like Isla Dawn and Alba Fire are going to get a shot at the title in Scotland. I mean, it only makes sense. You know, it's like Kaylee Ray and Courtney Stewart are Scottish. 
And Piper Niven is getting her shot. Drew McIntyre getting his shot. So where does Indy and Candice LeRae fit into this? Well, maybe Jay just kills Indy tonight and that's it. But I can also see Jade getting the win tonight and then Candace attacks her until Bianca makes the save. And we end up with a three-way at Clash in the Castle where Jade and Bianca drop the belts without ever being directly defeated. And you give, you know, Alba Fire the victory and she rolls up Indy Hartwell and gets the victory. And I know it's cheap, but it also protects Jade. It protects Bianca. People roll their eyes at it, but it's the Women's World Tag Team Championship right now. People will move on fast from it, especially if you then you get Alba Fire and Isla Dawn defending the title on the regular and you start getting some stories going there. And it frees up Bianca and Jade to do singles matches, which I think, you know, is going to be their main value. Obviously, you want them together as a unit, but you also want to have Bianca and Jade available to do either, you know, power versus size battles with Naya or having Bianca and EO having a good match or whatever it's going to be. You know, again, it frees them up to do that. NXT Battleground is Saturday on Peacock in the WWE Network from the UFC Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada. Tickets for this show, incredibly expensive and an incredibly small building. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of crossover. I thought they had a really great video when it came to Shayna Baszler and Lola Vice, and I kind of roll my eyes a little bit at the feud and how the whole thing has come about and the the entire use of NXT Underground with, with Natalia and Lola. I just thought it was less than stellar, and I would like to see it be more of a more of a Josh Barnett's blood sport style of thing. And we may have that here. I'd like to think we have that here with Shayna Baszler and Lola Vice. And look, I'm not saying that you can't put the WWE spin on it. I'm not saying that you can't do wacky things or do things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a blood sport environment, but also keep it serious here. Make Lola Vice a little bit more of a threat. We know she can shake it, you know, that's for sure, because she loves doing that, and she's got good kicks and good strikes. But also, you know, let's flesh her out a little bit more. Let's add some toughness to her. Let's add some some her trying to fight back and trying to escape Shayna. And I'm taking Shayna Baszler in this match. I, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe Shayna's going to get distracted, and Lola's going to land a strike, and that's what's going to end things. But I'm picking Baszler, you know, but don't put your money on it because, again, Lola Vice could, because she is a striker, get the victory. But I thought the video package, if you did not see it, I'm sure it's all over WWE social media. Check it out because I thought it was really, really well done. The main event of the show, Trick Williams and Ethan Page for the NXT title. Hard to believe that they would take the title off of Trick Williams. In fact, it's impossible to be to believe that they're going to do that. Now, what makes the most sense? Noam Dar. All he's got to do is cause a distraction. He doesn't even need to interfere. So you have a good guy and a fan favorite and a, and a clean wrestler picking up a tainted victory. Just have him be a distraction. You got Lash Legend out there. I'm sure she's going to be a distraction, but I have a feeling we're getting Ethan Page and Noam Dar to clean up the fact that Page was the one that attacked Noam. So... Trick Williams gets the victory here on NXT coming up this week. We either have Ethan Page and Wayam Dar, or we go ahead and start that process going. Oro Mensa, after the show, as I mentioned, when Brian was talking about NXT a couple of days ago, they did have a, a internet exclusive, a social media exclusive, where Oro Mensa attacked Ethan Page, so we'll probably get that set up first. The most intriguing match on the show for a lot of people, the NXT Women's Championship, Roxanne Perez, defends against TNA Knockouts World Champion Jordan Grace. I would think it's going to be Roxanne Perez. I would think it's going to be Roxanne Perez. Could you absolutely have Jordan Grace win that title? Yes, you could. 
because it's only coming up next week. And if we got enough time later on, I'm going to get to TNA Impact last night and their build towards Against All Odds coming up next Friday, June 14th. For those people who are subscribers to TNA Plus, it is available as part of your subscription. I'm sure it will be available uh, through other means as well, too, if, uh, as a, as a, a one-time pay-per-view buy. I would assume it will be available that way as well, but there is a lot of talk of WWE uh, participation on that show. There's going to be something with WWE, at least that is the, the buzz going on right now. So if Roxanne Perez, who's scheduled right now for an open challenge for that show coming up on June 14th to defend her knockouts title. Could she win the title here and then have somebody from NXT stroll on in, whether it be Roxanne Perez again or somebody else to take the title back off of her? That is very possible. Meechan, as an example, is doing things in NXT right now alongside the OC. She's somebody that is a, a tie that, that binds to, to TNA. So could you have her do something like that? Who's to say? We'll have to see what they do here. But as of now, I'm taking Roxanne Perez, but I wouldn't be surprised and fall over if Jordan Grace wins the match. NXT tag team title, Axiom and Nathan Frazier against Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. Yeah, I mean, I could see the OC winning, you know, if you want to keep Anderson and Gallows down there and be bullies and thugs to, you know, the young guys coming up and pushing around guys like Axiom and Frazier, you could do that. But I'd like to see Axiom and Nathan Frazier get the victory. I mean, let's be honest, the OC could continue to do that anyway without holding on to the belts. I like Axiom and Nathan Frazier as tag team champions. North American triple threat title match, Obafemi against Joe Coffey and Wes Lee. Unless your goal is to do what I was saying uh, when it comes to the possibility and my fantasy booking about what they could do with the WWE Women's Tag Team title, well, that's the same way it comes to, to this North American title match. Unless you're going to have Wes Lee defeat Joe Coffey or vice versa, you know, there's no way Obafemi is losing this match. Certainly no way he's getting pinned cleanly. And I think it would be insane to have him lose it anyway. I like him with the belt. I like him as a character right now. It's still something that they need to flesh out more with him, getting more comfortable on the microphone, becoming, I mean, God, the guy's got almost no experience whatsoever, and he's already a believable guy in the ring, but certainly needs some more seasoning. But hold on to that belt. I, I like the idea of him with that title. As I mentioned, Shane Baszler. I'll pick her over Lola Vice, but I won't be surprised if Lola gets the victory. And then the North American six-way ladder match to determine the first women's North American champion. Meechan, Fallon Henley, Lash Legend, Sol Ruka, Jada Parker, and Kalani Jordan. There's a lot of blue chips there as far as, you know, characters for the future up on the main roster in WWE in the same way that that uh, Tiffany Stratton is now up there. Kiana James, we'll see how things go there. They just started to put her in the mix this past week on Raw. To me, Fallon Henley is the one you want to win this to be your first champion. She's the one with by far the most experience there. She's by far the best worker. Well, I take that back. Meechan is the one with the most experience there. But I, when it comes to NXT terms, you know, to me, Fallon Henley winning that belt and kicking it off makes the most sense. So she could then pass it on to maybe somebody like a Kalani Jordan down the line. Got a whole lot more to get into when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. So Mike Sempervivi here with you. Wrestling Observer Live. Ratings news. Wednesday's episode of AEW Dynamite drew 790,000 viewers to TBS, according to WrestleNomics. That is slightly up from last week's audience of 787,000, and the best the show has done since April 10th, when it was the last time that it was over 800,000 people. They have not been consistently over 800,000 people since February. The rating of the 18 to 49 year old demographic was a 0.28, up from last week's 0.25, and also the best they've done in the demo since April 10th. Still not back over 400,000 yet in the demo, but they were close to it this week. So with the NBA playoffs 
out of the way with the NHL playoffs out of the way, and we're down to the NBA Finals and Stanley Cup Finals. Again, no excuses anymore. You've got the build going, leading things into Forbidden Door, and obviously you've, you've created some some attention because you've already announced Swerve and Osprey is going to be coming up. you got MJF back on the scene as well, too. Hopefully over time, people like Miro come back. Hopefully everything is lovely with Ricky Starks and he can get back in the mix. you got Jamie Hayter, who I know Tony Khan said there's no timetable for her return. But again, you know, all these pieces start coming back and they can start getting a groove and start getting some things going by the time we get to all in and all out. You know, for their sake, hopefully they're running on all cylinders. Rampage is tonight on TNT with matches that were taped on Wednesday night after Dynamite in Loveland, Colorado. This is your Colorado. Did I say that? Colorado. Colorado. Here's your no spoilers rundown of the card. Pentel Zero Miedo takes on The Butcher. Brian and I talked about Penta's contract situation yesterday. Dave writes about it in this week's newsletter as well. He says that Tony Khan has indicated confidence in re-signing Penta. Meltzer noted that there was some, there was some unhappiness with the 39-year-old surrounding his inability to be on the same AEW events with CMLL wrestlers as he has been affiliated with AAA in the past. But this week, those issues seem to have been rect- rectified Meltzer did note that some people think that Penta is looking to buy the rights to his name so he can use it elsewhere like WWE if needed. It would make sense considering, you know, his he stemmed from, you know, his 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 origin story was was Pentagon. And you you couldn't use that since AAA owns the rights to that. And we ended up with Penta El Zero Miedo, which is a little unwieldy. But, you know, there you go. And. As I noted, you know, with his relationship with George Kittle, with the fact that, you know, WWE has not been able to get out of their own way for the most part when it comes to the Latin American market and expanding their reach in Mexico and taking first generation Mexican fans, uh, Mexican American fans and turning them, you know, they have not done a good job with that. I don't think anybody's really been able to do a good job with that, even though WWE just because of size purposes ends up, you know, having more, uh, Hispanic and Spanish speaking fans than, than almost anyone, but really nobody, even though people have been featured here and there, no one's really been able to, to, to really, you know, grab hold of it. And somebody's going to do it sooner rather than later. You know, somebody has got to replace Ray Mysterio Jr. There's got to be somebody who can come along. And, you know, do they look at Penta for that purpose just because of the NFL stuff? You know, it's possible. So he's in a good spot right now. I digress, though. The acclaimed will face off against Hunter Gray and Parviz. Not Parvo, Parviz. Parviz? I don't know. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, the acclaimed are probably going to win there. Gates of Agony take on Private Party. Non-title six-man tag, the Bang Bang Gang of Austin Gunn, Colton Gunn, and Jay White will face off against Caleb Crush, Chris Wilde, and Tyler Payne. I don't know when Juice Robinson can come back, but as soon as he can get back in the ring, I don't care if they hold on to the six-man titles or not. And I'm not saying break up the Bang Bang Gang. In fact, I would absolutely not do that. But as a foursome, please, can we let Juice Robinson and Jay White team up and just do that? Let's do that. Let's do that. Tony Storm will also face off, uh, well, Tony Storm's opponent uh, coming up at uh, Forbidden Door, Mina Shirakawa will be wrestling, and she'll be taking on Tony Storm's last opponent that she had at the pay-per-view, uh, Serena Deeb. So that's what you got for tonight on Rampage. Collision, live Saturday night on TNT from the Mid-America Center in Council Bluffs, Iowa. It's the first time AEW's come to the building. There was a group called Pro Wrestling Phoenix, which has run there a couple of times during the O Comic Con, which uh, it takes place every year. In addition to Collision, ROH is, of course, also going to be taping as well. Three matches announced for the show thus far. Orange Cassidy against Kyle O'Reilly. Non-title match with Women's World Champion Tony Storm against Lady Frost and Blackpool Combat Clubs. Claudio Castagnoli and Wheeler Yuta against FTR and because John Moxley is not there FTR cannot get their revenge uh for being just laid out flatter than a 
plate of pee in the middle of the ring uh, by uh, the Blackpool Combat Club's Claudio and John Moxley. You know, Moxley's in Japan. I'm sure FTR is going to get the victory here. I'd like to think FTR is going to get the victory here, but we'll see. If they're going after the Young Bucks, which they have announced they have uh, on last week's show, that they're going to continue to do so. At some point, they got to win a match, and this would be good. Um, as far as attendance for this show, apparently there are still over 1,000 tickets roundabouts available, according to Russell Tix. About 1,600 have been distributed as of far, and that's going to be tomorrow night, Saturday night in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Tony Khan on Thursday announced via his social media that Mercedes Monet will wrestle next Wednesday on AEW Dynamite, which is being held in Des Moines, Iowa. Monet will be defending her TBS title against CMLL's Zeusis. Monet is also slated to defend the TBS title against Stephanie Vacker at Forbidden Door. New Japan Pro Wrestling, Dominion, Saturday, Osaka Castle Hall. Double main event. The 31st annual Best of the Super Juniors final is going to be the actual main event of the show, El Desperado against Taiji Ishimori. First time a junior heavyweight match uh, will headline a major show, and they're doing it without champions involved, and they're doing it over top of an IWGP World Heavyweight title defense. Desperado lost the 2020 and 2022 finals to Hiromu Takahashi. Ishimori, the only time he was in the finals was in 2018, where he also lost to Hiromu Takahashi. With the exception of Hiromu, these are the two guys that have been the backbones of the New Japan Junior Heavyweight Division now for years. Uh, lifetime, they're 2-2 two two against each other in singles matches, which that's how you use stats. It's not to be put up on the screen every week so you can counter wins and losses. This is how you use stats in pro wrestling. You use them in a sporting way. And these two guys, over their careers, are tied up against each other. Who will get superiority and who will get another title match uh, against Sho, who, my God, has not been a very good champion thus far. House of Torture show beat Yo when he dislocated his shoulder in the first minute of the actual match and then... Yo, uh, or Show also went on to defeat Doki in his second title defense. He beat Desperado, for those of you who don't maybe forgot about this or didn't know this, beat the guy by countout to win the title, if that tells you what the state of some of New Japan's booking is right now. And the said IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion Show is going to be a part of the other piece of this double main event, the Lumberjack match between John Moxley and Evil, on paper, this is a literal garbage match. It's a lumberjack match, so we can have an excuse to have a bunch of House of Torture interference and plunder be introduced. Evil is... He's been world champion. He does not need to be it again. House of Torture, Dick Togo, Sho, Ren Narita, Yoshinobu Kanemaru, Yujiro Takahashi, those are going to be his lumberjacks. Moxley has chosen... Uh, Shooter, Shota Umino, along with third-generation New Japan guys like Yuji Nagata, Tiger Mask, Hiroshi Tenzan, and Togi Makabe to be his lumberjacks. Apparently, Manabu Nakanishi, too busy. Uh, never open weight title. Also, on, oh, by the way, John Moxley is going to win that. Never open weight title on the show. Shingo Takagi defends against Hinare. I think I talked about this. Maybe it was on last week's show. I would put the belt on Hinare. See what you can do with him. Shingo doesn't need that belt. It would be a massive victory for Hinare. And it would be a, probably a good way to kind of like push him up into the upper echelon here. Him, Gabe Kidd, Hikaleo. There's a handful of guys, you know, young guys that they have there that look like they're going to be their future. Hinare is one of those dudes. Let's start going with it now. I have no idea who's going to win the IWGP tag team title slash strong open weight tag team title match. It's a four way Kenta and Chase Owens, Hikaleo and El Fantasmo, Hiroki Goto and Yoshihashi, and Shane Haste and Mike Nichols. Hikaleo and Fantasmo are the strong champions. Kenta and Chase Owens are the IWGP world tag team champions. I guess it really just depends on who do you want to come and be on Forbidden Door. And I'll go with TMDK, Shane Haste, and Mikey Nichols winning the belts. It would only make sense that they, alongside their partner in that group, 
Zack Sabre Jr., maybe also alongside one of their partners, Kosei Fujita. You know, they appear on a dynamite or a rampage or a collision or all three leading into Forbidden Door because I would believe there's going to be an IWGP tag title defense. And I also believe that Zack Sabre Jr. is going to be on that show as well, too. So there you go. Knock out a bunch of birds with those stones. New Japan World Television title, Jeff Cobb against Tomohiro Ishii. Hopefully, uh, hopefully Jeff Cobb wins that match. Never open weight six man tag team title match. Hiroshi Tanahashi, Toru Yano, and Oleg Bolton against Yoda Suji, Hiromu Takahashi, and Bushi. I, the only reason I could see the titles changing in this match is because then you have LIJ all belted up when they come over to the States for Forbidden Door because I don't know how you can have an event here if Hiromu Takahashi and Suji are not on there. So I, I, I'm assuming they're going to, to to come over to the state. So again, you don't have to change the belts, but if they do, that's probably the reason why. I don't know what storm catch rules are for the King of Pro Wrestling 2024 title, nor do I care. It's a waste of Yuya Uemura and Great Okan, but they will be facing off again for Uemura's title. Zack Sabre Jr., Robbie Eagles, and Kosei Fujita will face Clark Connors, Drill and Maloney, and LJ Cleary. I think uh, TMDK gets the victory there. And then, in what will be a night off and surely a lot of comedy, Tetsuya Naito, the former IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, will face off against Callum Newman. <laughs> Newman. Callum Newman. Tetsuya Naito. My money's on Tetsuya Naito. Impact was last night on Access. It was episode number 1307, their 20th anniversary episode of their their debut at Universal Studios. Actually, I don't know if there was their debut at Universal, but Impact kicked off on the Fox Sports Networks on June 4th, 2004. It was taped on June 3rd, and bottom line is with this show, we are leading into Against All Odds, and as I mentioned, even though they did note and run a video package with Jordan Grace talking about her match coming up against Roxanne Perez. They didn't beat you over the head with it. And as I mentioned earlier, Grace has got a open challenge for her knockouts world championship coming up on June 14th in Chicago. Also on that show, Moose against Matt Hardy, Ryan Myers and Eddie Edwards against the Nemeth Brothers for the tag titles, Mustafa Ali against Trent Seven for the X Division title, and Mike Santana and Steve Macklin against the Rascals. Be back to put a bow on this thing when we get back. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Sempervivi here with you. Wrestling Observer Live. I don't think there's really anything more to say. Not really, at least. End of this week. Trying to go outside into the sun here very shortly. Not a whole lot to get. There really was not a whole lot of consequence when it came to the actual anniversary of Impact being celebrated on the show. There were there were no old clips. There were just mentions by like Tom Hannafin a couple of times. Like, you know, in the opening match, Jake something uh, defeated, who was it? It was uh, defeated Con, Connor. The, the the with the into the void that he does and it's like oh it's an homage to to abyss upon the first show using the black hole slam to defeat shark boy but they're really other than that there really wasn't uh, anything else it was just about them setting up things for against all odds and steph delander did an interview with gia miller talking about pco being smitten with her because he gave her a black rose and a, a do you like me letter that said we or non on it. And before she had a chance to answer, Zaya Brookside ran out and was giggling about and told Steph to think about it because PCO was just so insanely sweet. If this is not leading towards Mance Warner and PCO murdering each other in some sort of way, I don't want to I don't want to deal with this thing. I, I don't. Uh, other than that, Mike Bailey, Trent Seven. Defeated Mustafa Ali and Campaign Singh, the former Champagne Singh after seven pin Singh, and that's leading into seven challenging Ali for his uh, his X division title at Against All Odds. And you know, time is running out here. You know, Ali around WrestleMania weekend, I think he signed like two months worth of dates for TNA, and we are kind of getting to the end of that here. So I really wouldn't think that Trent Seven would win the title. But then again, if you don't have Ali locked up, and you definitely have Seven locked up, 
Maybe you go in that direction. I don't know. AJ Francis also won the digital media title. Thank God. Laredo kid, he didn't deserve to have that. And I deserve to get out of here. Go enjoy some of this sun. I want to thank producer Daniel. I want to thank producer John. And I want to thank all of you out there for listening and watching. We shall talk to you again after a while.